Good evening, Bill. Good evening, Sandy. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? I'm excited. <laughs> okay, speaking of seeing this week, we're going to do story time. Um, most people realize that sometimes we go a bit rogue or certainly Bill does and prepares the content, but usually it is me. Uh, and so Bill sometimes comes to these uh, meetings, these dialogues, and he doesn't know anything. Completely about, blind. Yes, he doesn't know anything <laughs> about what we're going to talk about. When you saw the title story time, Bill, what did you think? I actually had no idea where you were going with it. I thought you'd go to the next slide and you're like, no, seriously, tell me a story. <laughs> I do wonder, you know, for um, photographers though, is any photograph a story? Uh, yes, I think, yes, absolutely. I think that I have a, I generally, it's interesting. I don't see stories in say, I can only really speak to my own work. I don't see stories in individual, just general portraits that I do, especially mm. if somebody's looking at the camera. But, you know, I've done series of conceptual stuff where I'm totally trying to like pack a story into a single frame, you know. Uh, I, I think it generally becomes somewhat ambiguous and, and lets you read into it a whole lot, which I think some of these are that way. Um, so I have uh, absolutely not gone what I would think of as a conceptual route with this. Yeah. I think I've probably gone the most traditional route I could have gone in many ways for story. Well, I think, I think in some ways the pictures that you chose, though, are either not like can't they're not posed they seem they're they're largely more candid you know or i don't know it's uh at least the first three are i think um okay. so let's take a well, look go, go, yeah go to the first one are you a bit are you uh, uh on a scale of one to ten carte bresson for you is where on where where on the charts a solid five solid five hmm. so you appreciate it but he's not one of those people for you no but i, I overrated just, no i i don't think that either i just think that i like many people who spend a lot of time looking at anything i've I kind of cultivated something that is that doesn't have to always be about big hitters. Yep. Uh, and that also doesn't mean that work has to be niche to please me in some way. Um, but actually, even in choosing the photograph by Bresson, I wouldn't say that this is one of his best known photographs. No, I mean, I, I, I know of it. It's never been one of my favorites of his either. Mm. And interestingly enough, I think in many ways, this one feels more um, composed than a lot of his others, as far as the interactions of the people. Yeah. Usually his pictures are very composed in what's in them, but then the people happen to be bystanders or their backs turned or kids playing or doing all those things. So the composition is really tight, but it doesn't feel directed. This yeah. one feels directed. Yes. So in the first slide, before we even got onto the images, you used that word candid. And, and in many ways, actually, I don't think this is quite as candid. Um, I certainly do this is feel what, that it's- Yeah, this is one right. of the least candid, I think, Carter Brisson photos. Yeah, and you know, I wonder about how an image like this might have sat in his conscience somehow. I mean, okay. you know, he's obviously gonna go on and be the, the father of Magnum. In fact, all the pho photographers on today's show are Magnum photographers. Mm, but I did pick this one because I think it, in terms of story, we could say a lot about how a story might unfold from a photograph and how when we see um, people, especially people, perhaps even more so than places, we build an entire matrix of story or stories do you mean after the fact in our own head of the viewer or after the fact in the head of the photographer? Even? As a viewer. Okay. Um, so really, 
as it isn't one of his better known photographs and as it is actually so seemingly directed and rather kind of contrived, um, what is the story in this photograph, do you think? Uh, well, it seems like, I, I always saw it as the two people on the outside shaving the person in the middle. Mm. Um, and yet, it's interesting when I used to, I, looking at it now, this is probably the most I've ever actually stared at this photo because it's never been one of my favorites. I mean, I've seen it hundreds of times, but like I've never stared at it. I used to think that it was all about the person in the middle. Mm. Um, but it's interesting, maybe just somehow they're, I mean, they're, they're in the center, they're a little bit bigger, they seem like they're leaning a little bit towards camera you know, than, than the two women are. But at the same time, like now that I look at it, all of them are looking straight into camera. Mm -hmm. It almost feels like some sort of, uh, um, uh, uh, what it was, uh, the Comedia dell'art or something like that. You know what I mean? Like some sort of weird play that's being put on. Bill, your sound's going very strange, I have to say. Just. Okay. I can do, is it, is it, is it, uh, 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 uh windy no it's like a kind of funny echo chamber sound just for people listening oh, apologize for um sound issues i know there were some sound issues last time as well um so we've got three characters that are all staring back at us into into the camera disconcerting often i think for a viewer to be so directly met with uh with a person within the frame and interesting, you say that you've never really stared at this photograph. I think, you know, like a book that is read over time, very often we have high expectations that a photograph is going to reveal everything immediately because it's visual. Um, and very often that's- Wait, how else could it show stuff to us? Because very often it takes time to sit, sit with something, to allow it to kind of emerge from itself. And really what that means, of course, is that we as the viewer are allowing our um, judgments to get out of the way, maybe, or allowing our judgments to rush in or to- Allowing our to, imaginations to take over. Something will happen, some kind of um, exchange within the viewer's own idea with what perhaps the photographer's intention was. There's also an exchange obviously between whatever is within the frame, the people within the frame, some kind of, uh, again, idea, this idea of a matrix that's built up. And so often I think we do a disservice to photographs by thinking that they're immediate. You know, to spend time with a photograph and allow it to kind of enrich, fortify. Do you ever take a photograph and you know, in the process of editing or making decisions about it, you're overthinking every little thing. You know, for example, in that window behind them, there's that little white bar that goes across the middle of that of that square. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Something like that. Where being the person who made the image, you might be that might be something that you're always like sticks in your craw. But then you show it to somebody else and they don't even notice that because you've just been looking at it way too much. But I think, again, this is something it's very important for us to think about. Is that, again, we're so saturated with images in our culture that, again, we don't give them enough time. And so how many people really get to a point with an image they look at where they can honestly say they deeply understand it because they've allowed it to go through that kind of enrichment process. You know, something that really pees you off that you notice in your own work. Um, and you say, you know, somebody else doesn't really notice it. Most people actually don't notice detail. At all. You know, it's something that is, it's quite shocking actually. And again, in my, in my life as a teacher is like training, training to notice. <laughs> You know, oh, okay, would you if 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 I showed you this picture and then turned it off and I asked you, what is on? Is anyone wearing a hat in this picture? Would you know <laughs> that the woman on the left is wearing a hat? Yes. See, I wouldn't have even thought about it. 
Shame on you, Bill Woodman. I'm t I couldn't tell you what color my wife's eyes are. I just don't have that kind of mind. But here's the difference. You know, you come on here and you and I talk about all of these things. So whether you notice them again at first glance or not, the fact is, is that you give yourself the opportunity to revisit them and you don't close yourself down. Okay, but how much time is enough time and how do you know when you, you've reached enough to where you have it settled? Or, or at least, I know you don't like the term settled. There's no yes or no, there's no right or wrong. Mm. How do you know when you've spent enough time with something that you can move on to the next one? Because I could spend a year staring at this photograph if I wanted to and pick out all kinds of things that I wouldn't see staring at it for five, 10 minutes mm. or 30 seconds or a second and a half. But there are 400 quadrillion other photographs in the world that I may be able to get something else out of. So how do you know when you've, when you've done your due diligence? Well, it depends on how you feel about this sense of being subject to a better offer, almost. Like, will, will the next one be more exciting to me kind of thing? Yeah, so, you know, that's a really obscure question, actually, Bill, because how does one ever know that one has reached the end of anything? And yes, you're I, 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 I absolutely true. Yeah. I don't, I don't um, particularly enjoy having to pitch myself in the future when the end will be all the time in order to appreciate now. Um, but what I can say is that when I'm with this photograph, let's just take this photograph because it's on the screen right now, I can't tell you how long I need. But what I can tell you is that even over the past few minutes of having it here right next to me, something happens where the story tells itself. Now, maybe it is the Sandy Robertson story that tells itself over and over again. But the fact- Coming to a theater near you. <laughs> yes, but the fact is, is that there are so many opportunities for story in a photograph such as this. And we might not like the photograph. We might not care about the people in the photograph. But actually, again, that's, that's perhaps being far too simplistic about what we see. So though I don't immediately like the people in this photograph, there's nothing that makes me warm to them, for example. When I spend sure. longer with them, what I start to realize is that I dig deeper, of course, just within myself, I dig deeper in myself in order to find the relationship I have to them, with them, and how they might then also, of course, have that relationship between them as a trio. And I love the sense that in every single photograph, there are these endless possibilities for story. But what's interesting, though, about what you just said is the idea that there are these three people in this photograph and the person who took the photograph, there's four people involved that you're somehow uh, 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 either you're through osmosis or something kind of merging with yourself in order to create a, a thing that's that's different, right? Like, it, like you know, you're, you're creating a piece of art by looking at this because you're you're taking all everything that's in this and sort of merging it with your experience and your story and how you see the world. My my counterpoint to that would be Carter Bresson didn't care about you. Carter Bresson cared about these three people. He doesn't I, I would look at it and say, I have nothing to do with these people. Mm -hmm. I don't see it as I I mean, I may not like this photograph for whatever reasons that have to do with my psyche or my experiences or whatever it is. Or I might like it for the same similar reasons, right? But ultimately, I do not identify with these people as, oh, I'm part of this experience. I'm very much a viewer and not a participant. But do you see yourself as a participant in the story? Not necessarily, but I do understand and appreciate, I think, the creative aspect of looking. Okay. You know, that's just picking up from what you're saying to me. It's a, it's a yeah. really, really good thing there. It's a, it is actually creative. Looking is creative. So unraveling a story 
it might not be even the right story. And again, I know people have real problem with this, especially with the way I say it about, you know, you don't have to know the truth in order to have a truth. Um, but simply, you know, you're right. Bresson doesn't really give a crap about me. But actually, maybe in a way he does. Because why else has he made the photograph? Well, knowing what I've read about Bresson, <laughs> I don't think he gave a crap about anybody. <laughs> no, no, no. But I, I mean, okay, let's let's. But 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 but, but 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 yeah. But the artist in general, yes. Um, I don't. Okay, I understand your theory. By the way, it's very interesting because I'm very cool and well, literally cold because I'm outside, and cool and sort of gray blue, and you're very warm inside of tungsten light. So you and I are like, you know, the heat miser and and the cold troll person. Anyway. It's just very funny looking at us stacked on my screen. You, I understand what you're saying about viewing and experiencing being a creative process, mm -hmm. but somehow this is, and this is gonna get me in trouble. Uh, as somebody who consciously and often solitarily makes stuff all the time, Yes, it's creative, but it's in a, it's like a completely different thing in the same way, in the same way that, you know, somebody who writes a play versus somebody who writes a review of the play. Yes. Writing the review of the play is also a creative thing, but it ain't the same as writing the play. So are you charging all lookers with a, a crime against looking? Uh, <laughs> I think that it is a, it is an it is an order removed from the person who made the thing in the first place. Hmm. I look down on my viewers, Sandy. That does appear to be what you're saying, Bill. Well, I just because they are not primarily they're not primary participants. They're always going to be secondary participants. They're they're primary participants in the secondary action of viewing the thing on a screen or in a book or whatever it is but like they weren't there with these people like the, the, the ultimately if there is a truth in this photograph it isn't my truth it's the truth that Bresson and these three people wanted to wanted to portray in this photograph so are the people in the frame creative in this case yes because i think that these people are putting on a show in a way this is not this is nothing about the pose of any of their hands or faces or bodies is in any way naturalistic in this photograph. So I think in this case, they, 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 they are in a creative process. In the next one, which we'll get to in a second, I think, no, I would not say that the person- Well, hang on a second, because I'm not going to let you yeah. leave this photograph yet. Okay. This is a very problematic photograph. I think it challenges expectations about what Bresson is famed for. Um, I think it also brings a, a sense of story that is particular maybe to what it says there in the title, Europeans. Um, very leading, perhaps quite disruptive title because of racist um, connotations of 1933 uh, ideas of what Europeans were? Maybe, yes. And also, of course, in the interwar years, there's a, and especially in Spain, you know, we're moving into Spanish Civil War territory. We're thinking about sure. um, a kind of diasporic narrative, uh, yeah. migrant narrative, African or, 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 or Middle Eastern people in different areas that were very also, white for a long time. And also a, a kind of um, something lost, story of lostness. You know, I think what, a lot- what is, What's being lost? What, what, what do you mean? Somehow, you know- Culture, that, that kind of- Yeah, a loss of- a loss That of, kind of crap, as I would say. A, a loss of culture that is not the, the nationalistic right to culture that I think a lot of people might assume, but a culture that's built up through these myriad 
stories brought together in places like um, Alicante in Spain, coastal, coastal towns where many people converge from many different places. At a time in history when convergence was both uh, uniting and conflicting So actually this photograph in terms of telling a story, you know, we could rush about and we could say, right, well, what was going on in Spain in 1933? Let's look at the title. Let's look at the kind of, let's, you know, it sounds uh, really obvious to say that we could make assumptions about the people, who they are, where they yeah. come from, what their individual stories might be based on what we perceive their cultural or racial background to be. Sure. Um, we could make assumptions about why they might be in Spain in 1933 and what they're doing together and and who yes who they who they are what is their relationship amongst themselves strip everything else away we know why is why is it that these three people happen in this space I also it's it, I always find it interesting because the, the central person it's like I see as a man but I also see like a like sort of a gender ambiguity to, yeah. to, to them. So there's like, there's also that kind of stuff going on. To all of them. It is in yeah, some ways a fascinatingly timeless, genderless, cultureless, yet cultureful photograph. And actually, this is what I mean about spending time with something, not rushing away from it because we don't like it. Spending time with it and allowing things to kind of come up or emerge. I think we are so we're so guilty of rushing past things because we think we know. Well, truthfully, I know nothing. I know nothing when I begin. And I actually don't know very much when I leave. But well, that's what, what I was going to ask. How much do you think you actually gain it? And do you actually think you're better off at the end? Or do you think you just made up some more stories in your head that just, you know, I don't mean that as a derogatory thing. I'm just No, but I, I'm going to come back to, I'm going to come back to this question. What is the point of okay. any photograph if not to make a story? Yeah. Bill. What? I'm sitting back. <laughs> what? Well, also don't abdicate uh, the responsibility to answer the question by putting yourself way back here in the space. You know, a photograph tells a story. Do you agree? Uh, Yes, but sometimes I think a photograph is just a photograph. Can a photograph exist without telling a story? Yes. How so? Uh, what were we looking at a couple weeks ago? We were looking at the, uh, uh, um, what's his name? Japanese photographer, big gray. Sugimoto. Sugimoto, thank you. I mean, that is literally a gray gradient. Mm -hmm. We know what it's a photograph of, and so we read all kinds of stuff into it. But like, at what if it was a, if I made a photograph right now in a dark room with absolutely no lights and it was a black frame? What is the story of that photograph? It's a photograph. Well, the it's not showing you question, anything. The extension question would be then: Is who is the storyteller? Yeah. Now, the assumption would be, well, the photographer is the storyteller. Well, no, not always. In fact, often well, I, we find ourselves in the role of storyteller because, again, allow it, what we talk about frequently now, the sense of it allows us to identify, it allows us to feel a sense of belonging or relationship to what we see. Um, it positions us. Whether that's right or wrong, it doesn't actually matter. Yeah. Who is the storyteller? I don't agree with what you've said, and it's seldom that I am so black and white, but I fundamentally do think that all photographs tell stories. I think okay. what changes and has a kind of uh, fluidity to it is who the storyteller actually is. Wait, who, who else could the storyteller be? The viewer? Mm -hmm. This is a little bit like in The Incredibles where they say, you know, if everybody's special, that's just another way of saying that nobody is. So we're all, we're all creators. We're all storytellers. Okay, that's true. But that really means that storytelling doesn't mean everything if everyone does it. I also don't agree with that. 
time. Why, why shouldn't why shouldn't everybody have the opportunity to tell stories? Everybody has the opportunity to tell stories, but I don't think that necessary. If if I look at an image and I come up with some crazy cockamamie story in my head about what's going on in that image, that has no bearing on. I mean, that's just me having an imagination and making something up from crazy inputs. You know what I mean? That's that's not necessarily having any relation to 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 the image other than it's almost like that's like a dream state kind of thing. It's like, what does my mind do when I dream? Well, it takes a bunch of fragments of things and puts them together into a crazy storyline. Mm -hmm. But, it, you know, it doesn't mean that my third grade teacher drives a Porsche to space every Thursday afternoon. You know what I mean? We spoke before about um, how sometimes when we give opinions about photographs, yep. actually opinion is vital because it allows us to feel like we have some participation in what we're doing. But at the same time, to say I like this and I don't like that with others, unless of course a conversation between friends you know, to give an opinion often is actually extraordinarily dull. Sure, but do you, but you, further you, to you, that, used, you just used the word vital though. That yes, like, it's vital that we have this experience. Yes, and tell these further stories. to that, I would say that of course it's still vital to have the opinion because it doesn't matter if it's sometimes, you know, I know this is really, I'm not gonna say difficult, it's not difficult for you. I just don't think you agree with me. Um, it doesn't matter if the story is right or wrong. It doesn't matter if it's dull or interesting. What really matters is that we give time for the story to emerge. And if it means that we are the storyteller, then so be it. If it means the photographer has full control over the story, it does not disqualify the viewer from having space within that story nor does it disqualify the people within the story of the photograph to have their own individualized narrative that could emerge because of the relationship the viewer then develops through looking. I, I, okay, I think that that is all true. But in that case, your, your, your story of what this photograph means does not exist if you don't see this story. Where this photograph exists whether or not you look at it. Mm -hmm. It's like th th there's there's a there's a you know does a piece of art need viewers in order to be a piece of art? He could have taken this picture, stuck it in a drawer, no one ever saw it. Maybe he didn't even look at the film. It's still there. It's still a thing that was created. It's still something that was made. It was it was it is it is it has it has you know uh, like Platonic uh, uh, Aristotelian you know form. But Bill, the point would be is that we are looking at it. We yeah. are looking at it and we're looking at it also in context of story time. Okay, here's my question to you though. If you look at a piece of work and your mind doesn't cr ha have its own contribution to what the photograph means by you imbuing the, 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 the image or the people in it, with a story of your own design. Does it ever does it ever happen that you look at something and you get you don't get any of that? Or do you always get that? Like is that a requirement for you to actually see something? Is to sort of make it your own by inhabiting it? No, because even the most nebulous imagery still create some kind of resonance. I wonder if we could use an interchangeable language here, actually, because sometimes, obviously, language is extraordinarily misleading. You sure. know, I titled this story time. We're talking about story and narrative and so on. And, of course, because we've used already, we've told everybody all the photographs today are from Magnum photographers. You know, there's a sense of, um, a, a, you know, a, a documentary, so a social documentary something that's been documented for the purpose of telling um but actually we could change the word story for resonance and think about how photographs create resonance or resonances within viewers and so 
I use the word nebulous. You don't have to have something that's kind of uh, representational for there to be a resonance. Mm -hmm. And so the story doesn't have to be even the way we may expect a story to exist. A story, no, I understand. You know, yeah. a story is, you know, we have a beginning once upon a time and we have an end happily ever after or whatever. But actually a story isn't that. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly was not assuming that that's like the level of stuff you meant. I just meant that like the, 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 the sort of feeling that you get, you inhabit by looking at something is in itself all of those things. I just, it's, do you think that some people are more, feel all of this more intensely than others? Like, do you think that in this case, maybe you and I are talking about the same thing. I feel at a level three, so I don't give it as much import. You feel it at a level eight, so therefore you give it more import. And that's the, that's the discontinuity between our opinions. Mm. Sometimes I think you're feeling it at level three, Bill, just out of sheer contrariness. Um, Grr. <laughs> of course, call me, Dave, call me Christopher this Hitchens. Is why, this is why, one, it's why people have conversations about anything. Sure. Yes, uh, you do not have to see what I see and you do not have to care as much as I care. But if you were me, if you were me, with my experience and my suffering and my, you know, joy, you would think and feel exactly as I do. But isn't that, isn't that saying that I somehow don't think or feel or have the same experience, have my own experiences that, that inhibit no, me? No, it's, it's saying exactly not that. It's saying, it's saying okay. that you have what you have. What yes. I'm suggesting is that rather than rushing past things because we don't like them, or because we don't see a, an instant value in it, that we just allow stories to emerge. Because that is actually being not only respectful to the photograph, it's being respectful to the photographer. It's also being respectful to oneself without having to rush ourselves constantly onto the next thing, onto all those gazillions of photographs that may or may not be better than this one. Well, yeah. So but what if, what if you spend all the time looking at a photograph you don't really like and inhabiting it, doing all of these things, and then you realize you just spent a year of your life looking at a photograph that you didn't really like all that much, and you missed all these things that would have given you a whole lot of joy? Mm. See, that's a good picture. By the way, one of the things I was going to say, it's one of the reasons why I've never been particularly good or been particularly interested in street photography um, is because it's, it's got this dualistic thing where you are looking for a story and then trying to frame a story simultaneously. You know what I mean? Like you don't get to create it, but you do get to put a frame around it. And by putting a frame around it, you are creating a story. And there's just something about that whole act that was taking that takes way too much control out of my hands to the point where it's not interesting to me. I can, I will, I can appreciate other people's street photography, but the idea of like carrying around a camera and walking through Midtown holds zero interest to me for those reasons. And so it's interesting when you were, I mean, the fact that the people in the Carte de Bresson photograph are obviously very posed, which I know is not normally his thing. This guy doesn't feel posed to me. Maybe he was, we don't know. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, there's the, uh, you know, lots of famous shots that we look at now were far more posed than we think that they were at the time. But I think it, it changes. Is there a difference between a uh, reality and a manufactured reality? You know, if Smith was walking by and he saw this guy walking on the road next to this patch of grass or whatever it is. And he's like, oh man, this is really cool. Can you just like go over there and walk towards me this way? I want to get a picture of you walking. Or maybe this is his best friend who just happens to have his friend's medical bag or whatever it is. Does that change the way you see it vis-a-vis -vis whether or not, it, whereas it would be different if it was actually just him sitting there when a doctor walked by? It maybe changes the perception, but it doesn't change the possibility of the yield 
Okay. Um, and also, I would just like to say, um, Smith laterally did get himself into a bit of hot water, really, um, in terms of truth. You know, as one of the finest photographers, American photographers working in this kind of style, this photo essay style. In fact, I mean, he's really, he's really like the, the, the god of the photo essay. You know, he's working for life. He's fully fledged magnum photographer he's really you know he is godlike in his status and as we said just before we started i'm always surprised actually how few people know him yeah. know him by name um he 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 has been kind of recalled i guess on how truthful he was sometimes in some of his photographs and it could be really subtle things like, um, I haven't shown it here, but uh, what he traveled extensively. There's a photograph of a dead man uh, with his family crowded around in a small village in Spain where um, Smith had been documenting other things. And I think he used some additional light or something to illuminate the, the face of the dead man in a slightly different way and it became almost kind of like a, a a kind of religious painting you know it was false the light was false enough that the 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 kind of feeling or the the context of the image could be misread was manipulated if you were taking it as photojournalism and yeah, so he, he sometimes got himself into a bit of hot water. I mean, Smith is renowned for being absolutely obsessed with stories, obsessed. Uh, he left a legacy when he, when he died or even before he died, he had all his stuff taken off to be archived and it filled up a kind of small stadium because he didn't just photograph, but he documented furiously in terms of writing journals. He also had, I think, maybe thousands of audio tapes. He was constantly recording everything that was going on around him. You got to think about, there's a lot of artists out there where you may know some or all of their sort of finished work, as it were. And then you find out how insane they were as part of their process, mm. you know? And it, sometimes it really changes the way you look at your work. You go, oh yeah, this guy is crazy. And that lady was nuts, you know? It, but you, you may appreciate it. It, it, may, it may give you more respect for the person, but it also may make you question that person. Well, I think, you know, we have enough distance now as an audience between us and, and Smith, you know, and also we're not editors at life having to corral him. Sure. Uh, you know, his his process often got in the way of him apparently uh, being able to communicate effectively enough with the people who needed he needed to communicate with effectively. Funnily okay. enough, it's such an irony, isn't it? That here he was this purist as a photographer in so many ways, yet he had these extremely turbulent and difficult relationships with the people who controlled how his images would ultimately be seen because he was known as troublesome. Yeah. And that was to do with the dedication he had to his craft. I mean, he, uh, I'm just gonna read something I, I was looking earlier. Um, <laughs> I just have to say also troublesome, known as being troublesome. He, uh, he ran a course for a little while and it, he actually called it photography made difficult. I just thought that's amazing. I'm going to actually, yeah. I'm going to launch part of my course is going to be photography made difficult. Photography. I, I think I too I'll, easy. I'll let you read your thing in one, one second. I just wanted to add that, that, you know, I think that there's this, this period in the thirties, forties and fifties when things like life magazine were around and stuff. And yeah. I've met people who were around at this time, you know what I mean? Like, and I've met people who really knew some of these guys and there is this weird rose-colored glasses haze put on this whole period of photojournalism mm -hmm. where everything was like the golden age of, of all the rest of it. And it was for the output, but 
there was a lot of crazy stuff going on. And some of these people are not the best people who were involved in this stuff. They were, they were no. real jerks and real, you know. I mean, I don't think so, it means necessarily that he was a total jerk, although I get the impression that uh, <laughs> quite a lot not of Not necessarily him, but was. there are a lot of others who, yeah, um, who were just, I mean, you know. He was uh, an alcoholic. He was uh, addicted to amphetamines. Uh, he was so obsessed. All the good what, stuff. With what he was doing. Um, he did say a uh, photo is a small voice at best, but sometimes, just sometimes, one photograph or a group of them um, can lure our senses into awareness. Um, much depends upon the viewer. In some photographs can summon enough emotion to be a catalyst to thought. Mm. Do you, have you seen the... This is an answer to your statement just now, the, the, the question. Have you seen the, the Magnum uh, Contact Sheets book? Uh-huh, yeah, I have it, I think. Um, does it make a difference to you if you saw this picture and you said, you know, I took one frame, this is the one frame, versus seeing a contact sheet of 36 or 24 or 12 images that are all similar-ish, and you see the one that was chosen out, the one that ended up becoming famous, quote unquote. Does it change the way you see the final one to know that those other ones existed? Probably not when it's from a body of work such as this. I, Do you want to see those others? I think they're very interesting for something that is 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 approaching a broad sense of of truth. Truth, truth. Yeah. I, I mean, again, this is part of the obsession. Country Doctor is part of a, a series. He was working in Colorado. He followed this doctor, I think, for 23 days. He lived with him. He was with him all the time. He saw everything the doctor did. Um, and again, I haven't shown it here because sometimes I do wonder about photographic content on YouTube that can be accessed by anyone. Some very... Um, very disturbing photographs I could have, have chosen for this today. Mm -hmm. And I, I chose this one because it's loaded with story, of course, but it also has an element of the benign about it. Something about the, the doctor midway or somehow lost in thought as he walks. But there's a, a most extraordinary photograph from this series where it's um, Dr. Suriani, I think his name was the doctor, Ernest Suriani. Um, and it was a, it was a photo essay in, in life where the doctor is standing again, the same, very similar look on the face. And he's actually just delivered a baby by cesarean section and the baby and the mother have both died. And the photograph captures the doctor's sheer be bewilderment maybe i mean language at this point for me is very very tricky because i i don't want to mislead listeners or viewers do go and have a look at the photograph if you can bear it it's a profoundly moving photograph but actually i find this photograph profoundly moving as well not just because I know about the rest of the series, but because when I look at this, and again, perhaps it is to do with Country Doctor and the date, I think about what would have been available to this man, tending people, tending humans, trying to preserve life, again, at a period in history that would have been struck with, um, or rather communities struck with, um, still a resonance of loss and of grief left over from the Second World War. There would have been a sense that he was perhaps working on his own. And again, the wider photo story is testament to that. You know, he was sometimes working in collaboration with, for example, a midwife, but very often he was just a doctor on his own in a very small community, trying to make the sick well. Now that is loaded up. I also think about, you know, looking at a photograph such as this now, like today, now, in the midst and grip of this COVID menace pandemic, 
and thinking about the role of a doctor, again, a whole other layer of story rushes in. And yes, this is where I then suddenly take over a storyteller and not Smith. But the fact is, again, stories are, what is a story? Why do we, why do we even have stories? Why are we doing it? You know, humans are compelled to tell each other stories. But, but isn't it interesting though, in, in this case, with this guy, with this doctor, that, you know, look, I'm a photographer. I'm not knocking photography and I'm going to knock photography in general, but I'm knocking myself in the process. Do we sometimes give ourselves way too much import, you know, in the sense that, you know, yes, you're experiencing this guy's, you know, the, 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 the hell that it is to be a, a country doctor and losing your patient, losing a baby and like what's going through this guy. And yes, Smith is taking that photograph so you can experience that. But really, ultimately, it's this country doctor is the center of everything. He's the one experiencing it. Mm -hmm. The fact that Smith is there to experience it, to take the picture so that you and I can talk about it and, and we can get upset by that picture 75 years later um, is also kind of a weird, you know, second secondary tertiary level kind of experience to what was the experience of that doctor or even more so that woman or her husband or whoever else was around. Right. Um, it's interesting. It's like, the, it's, it's like an onion. You know, we're just it, like, we're layering stories upon stories upon stories. It is. And I, but I don't think I, I agree that I think, you know, we we're all guilty of inflating our own importance through stories. Yes. Doesn't mean that we shouldn't tell stories, listen to stories, communicate them to each other, because that is the lifeblood of how we, I guess, develop understanding beyond our understanding. And that doesn't mean that I think I understand the doctor, because not having been a doctor and not having delivered a baby myself, apart from when I actually did give birth, um, I, I, I have no way of, of understanding this anguish other than through the prism of seeing him here and being open and available to his story. It doesn't mean that I imagine myself to be a doctor or imagine myself to be capable of his skill or his depth. But I, I do think again, are we too important? Do we give ourselves too much credit? Maybe. I just mean that like the title of this photograph is Country Doctor because Smith decided that that's what it is because it's from the series. My point is, is that why the heck isn't the doctor's name primarily there and Smith has like just a, a credit underneath, you know what I'm saying? Like that's the way that you could for, you know, see it in a, in a different light. By the way, I think just check your time because I think we're, we're we're doing our thing that we do where we go along, where we keep talking. Well, we don't have very many photographs this evening for that, re okay. <laughs> for that reason, Bill. I would just like to finish on this because it, it is important to what we're saying. Again, it's uh, Smith talking. Um, just after he made this series, he said, I feel that my art um, or my necessity is communication. And this could apply to many branches of communication. Uh, whether it be writing or photography. So it was necessary to him to communicate the stories of this person, these people. It was necessary to communicate a story. Is it a compulsion? In his case, probably, but more widely. Well, that's just a sad photograph. You know, it's interesting about, and I think this is a change that has been happening in society over time. Mm -hmm. I think that this woman, you know, at this at this bar in this brothel in Havana in 1954. This is not how I feel. I'm saying this is how society 
I think would have seen this over time is that a large portion of society would have made her sort of a nameless, faceless person who happens to be a prostitute at a brothel or whatever it is. Where I think now there is far more of an understanding of that, you know, she is this individual who had a name that we, we don't know, but you know what I mean? That like had, it was an individual with experiences and wasn't just a character in a play. I always find this photograph filled with tenderness. Oh, see, yeah, this, that's, I do not see tenderness. I, I, see. I, think, I think Eve Arnold looked at this girl with tenderness. Oh, I think Eve Arnold does, but I don't think, I don't think that what's going through that girl's head has anything to do with tenderness. It's interesting, you see it from the perspective of the photographer, where I instantly see it from the perspective of the person in the photograph. Not always. In fact, Bill, actually, it's usually the opposite way round. For you and I, you mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but in this case, interestingly enough. I wonder if it's because it's a female photographer looking at a female in my case now. Very often I'm looking at representations given to me by male photographers, and that maybe shouldn't be a thing, but often it is. Um, and that, I, that you or I are not... Sorry, big giant fire truck going by. Um, that you or I are not as as responsive to artists of the opposite gender. Is that what you're, is that, is that what you're trying to like? I'm not saying we should. You know, is that kind of what you're getting at? I, I don't. Uh, no, I I maybe just think particularly with um, Arnold's work ah, when she photographs okay. women. I mean, she obviously her first published book work was uh, the un the unretouched woman. I think it was called. Um, and it included all these photographs of, of women from all around the place, um, from what we may consider high and low. It's a, it's a, it's a, it is a, it is a woman looking at, at women and thinking about their particular voice, their particular struggles and, and their particular struggles in that voicelessness of of the time. Yeah, that kind of was what I was kind of getting at in a, in a way, like trying to give voice to people who were maybe not even noticed in a lot of ways. Anyway, in terms of story, again, you know, we, we've got a bit of art detective going on here. And in fact, again, for teaching purposes, I use this in sixth form a lot to try and get people to think about how we use our judgments and, and what we know to, to try and create the story. And then often the story does actually match up remarkably well, because if we're sensitive and sensible and we have a, at least a slight knowledge of a wider world, we could probably have a bit of a guess, you know, without the title there we could still have a bit of a guess at, at perhaps who this girl is. But I always find that fascinating with stories is that we often tell ourselves tales that um, regurgitate what other people want, want us to think. You know, culture told us that this girl is a prostitute. Isn't that a shame that that is the- Well, the title does we, say- no, I'm, I'm, talking that, I'm talking that if we just met this fresh, right that, that actually we might still arrive at that conclusion about her and yes it happens to be the case that yes she is a bar girl in a brothel but isn't it so sad that that's what we reach but you, do you think that that's what eve arnold wants us to reach well no as i said i think that i mean i see this in great tenderness because i think eve arnold presents this young woman in great tenderness yeah but i i mean she could she could, she could see her that way, but it's not changing who who the woman at the at the at the the bar is. You know what I mean? Like, no, there might be I, the lens that she uses to 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 on a phrase, but but I wonder if the story we could talk about in this context for this photograph is actually about the sad story we tell ourselves with all the kind of tropes and contrivances and the connivances of culture 
that makes us know that this young woman must be a prostitute. Yeah. That's what, you know, we have different levels and ways of storytelling. Well, I think storytelling can also be very manipulative. What story does it tell me about myself that I reach the conclusion? What does it tell me about my prejudices and my failings and my sensitivity? Desires. Exactly. So, you know, again, stories, where do they take us? What do they make us? I think the whole thing is so fascinating. Maybe you want to see tenderness because you want other people to see you with tenderness. Bill, don't try and be deep for the sake of it. (laughs) I'm just... (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so we're zooming forward in time. It's got quite a big jump now. But actually, again, before we started recording, I did say that, I mean, I could have taken something from the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, or the noughties for Jim Goldberg. He is a a, a stalwart, although he is in so many ways so different from the others we've seen. He is nonetheless still a magnum photographer. He is known as a a documentary photographer. He is working uh, with kind of, a level of sort of social um, storytelling that makes him, in my opinion, uh, a great, truly great storyteller. I mean, you you could argue that this is not so much photography; it's a superset of photography. You know, I mean, this is this is collage, this is reporting, this is poem. You know, I mean, like, do you know the translation of of what's written here? No, but I actually think that that is part of this, isn't it? That we're um, not going to speak this particular language. And yet we know there is additional language available to tell a story. And that at every level we're met with story. We're, we're, we're met with story when we see the color of the ink we're met with story. And, and, the, and the, the black and white, the monochrome of one photograph and the color of the other, yeah. Yeah, so uh, there's so many different things going on. As you say, it, it's, it, you know, it's collage, it's yeah. poetry, it's all, it's all kinds of things colliding in one space. Um, but Mr. Monozadi, Goldberg, like, most other Magnum photographers is extensively traveled. He was really interested in uh, the migrant crisis before it became kind of like a, a buzz phrase of 2010 onwards, you know, especially here in the UK and Europe um, after the Arab Spring, the, you know, even though migrant crossings have been happening from North Africa always uh the fact is is that there was then many more migrant stories emerging because of people displaced uh particularly from Syria uh anyone here who would have known the the photograph of Alan Kurdi, the little boy who washed up on the beach. I, again, you know, I could have shown that photograph here for story because it's actually remarkably, I'm not going to say it's the same story. It's a, it's a similar story. It's but but I think that because that photograph has been so, that photograph has been so seen that it actually, it take, it, that's the other thing you could discuss with all this is, photographs that are really, really well known, whether the notoriety and the history of the photograph is a whole other level of story. You know what I mean? That, that has to get taken on when you're looking at it or, or thinking about it. I think what's fascinating uh, with this, this image is that obviously we're looking at a man who has been physically got at. You know, we can see that huge scar, yeah, that terrible he's, he's wound. been mutilated, yeah. Oh. I mean, this this is from the series called Open Sea, which is Open Sea, S-E-E, which of course, again, could be a play on words because Open Sea is the migrant crossings that so many of these people make. 
And look at my language that I'm using. My goodness, shame on me, these people. But Mr. Monozadi, his whole village was, was massacred in DRC. His wife and his eight children killed in front of him. This yeah, is yeah. his story. Goldberg records this. And what I love about Goldberg is that we're talking about, you know, whose story is available to us. Is it the photographer? Is it the subject? Is it the viewer? Well, Goldberg, I think, is so skillful because he gives back the story to the subject. So, I mean, it is Ndiho Monozadi who's telling us the story. Goldberg is the conduit, Goldberg is the vehicle to get that story out, but actually to give the images back to the subject and allow them to write, you know, Raised, is it Raised by Wolves, his work with um, children and young people in, for, I think from the late seventies, early eighties, Raised by Wolves, these kind of street children in the States, you know, the kind of feral nature of them, but he gave them back their photographs and allowed them to have a voice beyond just the, the photographic representation. Um, it's a fascinating extra layer. We're always talking about layers, you're, you and I know, but. Well, I, I, I also think that, I mean, if you look back on uh, when, when it was the Belgian Congo and the crap that went on with King Leopold and everything in, in Central Africa, I mean, I mean, just unbelievable atrocities for a century. You know what I'm saying? We're, we're, we're going on in a lot of these places. I mean, there's just, there's places in the world that have just known nothing but turmoil and war and pain. It just, it's so, you know, and you see these photographs of people with no hands from a hundred years ago, because they would cut off each other's hands to prove that they had, you know, gotten people, you know, there's all kinds of crazy things that have happened and then you see it still happening today 10 years ago people who have scars from their lifetimes mm. but and, and just, just i mean like sort of continuities through time are also just have their own has this whole backstory you know speaking of stories yeah but that i mean we are talking about stories aren't we and, and we yeah. mustn't forget that though this story is particularly horrific and belongs to its own family set of stories um, that comes with, for example, migrant crisis and a much greater humanitarian crisis at a period in which, you know, humanity is struggling on all levels. The fact is, is that even those people who may at first glance appear to be so playful in the Bresson photograph, you know, they, they have their own story and crisis and that story mustn't be diminished by um by us the fact that there's so many others yeah by us moving past it so quickly sometimes the enormity of the problem uh actually makes things feel smaller you know individual elements feel smaller if that makes any sense i mean i think we could do an entire program just really on goldberg sure and trace them from the 70s forward because you know this though it may again at first glance be that well you know he's really kind of doing just the same thing the whole time he's allowing people to take their photographs back and own them and write on them think of many think of many actual stories there are in his now vast archive how much of this is is goldberg and how much is it this gentleman well, that, that's really the point, isn't it? That again, it is playing with the idea of who owns a story, who has the well, right. Sure, but that, I mean, that, that's an interesting, you know, uh, uh, you know, art class metaphysical conversation, but like fundamentally, Mr. Marazandi owns this, owns this whole thing more than Goldberg does in a lot of ways. I wonder, I wonder if Goldberg is the caretaker of the story. Okay. But does that make him an artist of the story? Or does that make him the caretaker of the story? I mean, these are euphemisms in some ways, you know? We could say, is any artist a caretaker of a story? 
Sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's degrees. It's all, I just, I just mean it's something like this where it's almost certainly a collaboration in many ways, a very tilted collaboration. I mean, it's basically the form that is Goldberg's. The rest of it is somebody else in some ways. Do you mind that? No, except that Goldberg's the one making the money. <laughs> Does it bring this story to our attention? Yeah. Mm. Again, uh, I mean, this, is, this is definitely one where, though, where we're making up less of a story in our own head and kind of seeding ourselves to the reality of the story that is. Well, hang on there. We don't actually know what's been written, do we? No, we don't. I'm, I'm just saying we assume that this person was attacked, that they, you know, had some terrible things happen to them in a country that's very war torn, and that they were leaving. I mean, the, the broad strokes of it are 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 probably correct. We don't know what it says. You're right, hmm. but we're certainly not coming up with some outside, out of bounds, fantastical story about this person. No, you know but don't, I mean? this don't is... forget, Bill. With all due respect, I did tell you a lot of information about this. True. Actually. So without that, as much as we can, you know, this is like saying when we look at Bar Girl, uh, Bar Girl in Havana, we take away the title. Do we reach True. the conclusion? True. This, is, this is again about a story of our own uh, understanding or lack of understanding. It's about our own tale of compassion or our ability to be compassionate. It's about our sense of, um, well, what it is to be human, really. Yeah. I mean, if you saw this in, in a gallery or something, would you want a translation of the words? Not necessarily. Yeah, I'd want to know what it says. <laughs> yes, of course. Mm. Anyway, I'm sorry for the wind, it's getting very windy up here. Well, it's time for us to finish. And again, as usual, I feel like um, we scratch. We're just beginning when we're ending? We scratch away. <laughs> and we get to a point where I think we're coming up on something, but we probably would need another hour and a half to get close to it. Yeah. I think it's a little bit like the old uh, parable, right? Like, is, 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 each time we get half as close, we're really not getting any, we're never going to reach the end. Well, on that Zen note. Actually, it's Zeno's paragraph, paradox, isn't it? That, that thing that I'm talking about. I have no idea, Bill. Yeah, Zeno's paradox, I think. So we will finish on me not knowing. And I'll see you next time. All right. We'll talk to you soon, Sandy. Bye.